Good morning, Good morning everybody. Uh, I hope you're, you're safe and sound in the world uh, in this uh, uh, rainy day. Uh, uh, today, today we're going, going to discuss, discuss the presidential system as one of the types of uh, political systems. So before we start, let's uh, recap what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've been discussing that any government around the globe has three branches, a legislative, an executive, and a judiciary branch. And uh, we've discussed the uh, functions of the legislative branch and the, its history. How um, do we get different forms, different types, or different shapes, or different bodies of legislative body, and what they do. And uh, we did also a brief introduction about the executive, the history of the executive branch and its development and its main functions. And we mentioned very briefly uh, the judiciary as the branch of the government that solves the problems emerging from um, um, legislation and implementation of the law. And uh, uh, hopefully in the coming uh, lectures, we'll have more time to discuss the judiciary. Back to the uh, legislative body, as you all remember, we discussed uh, its development and uh, different experiences around the globe, uh, the bicameral and the eucameral, and why a country should uh, choose one of them over the other. And we have also discussed the main uh, functions of the legislative body, which are um, to legislate, to oversee uh, the government and approve its action to serve the uh, uh, community and to educate the public. And uh, there is one more function. I hope you still remember them and I'm not going to repeat it. And in terms of the executive, we have discussed that uh, in terms of the executive, their main function is to uh, uh, implement the laws approved by the legislative body. And uh, there are different types of the executive. Uh, uh, one elected directly by the people, which is the uh, president. And in other cases, we have executive that are not directly elected by the people, which like the prime minister in the UK, for example. So when we're talking about presidential and parliamentary system, we're mainly talking about different types of relationship between the legislative and the executive branch. In most cases, the judiciary branch is not really uh, uh, important in determining the type of the uh, 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 political system, whether it's parliamentary or presidential. Rather, it's the relationship between the legislative and the executive. Around the globe, there are three political systems, uh, the presidential system and the parliamentary system, and the, the third one is the semi-presidential system. We're going to discuss today the presidential system, and later on we're going to discuss the parliamentary system, and maybe we have some time to discuss the semi-presidential system. The point is that uh, we cannot really decide which system is better, uh, for a specific country. Each country should be able to decide whether to follow a presidential system or a parliamentary system or a semi-presidential system based on number of factors, mainly uh, based on the political culture, based on the um, uh, history of institutions, uh, political institutions that exist in the, uh, in the country, based on the ability of political parties to uh, develop programs and alternatives, many factors that would affect the choice um, of the country to go for a presidential system or a parliamentary system. So the bottom line is that there is no better system. It's two different or three different types of organization uh, of the uh, legislative and the executive branches, and none of them is better than the other. It, the point is that uh, um, for a certain um, country at a certain point in history, one of them is more convenient and suitable for the system. The other point is that um, countries sometimes shift 
um, between a parliamentary system and presidential system, meaning that uh, certain countries adapt one system for a period of time and uh, later on might uh, decide to change. Like the case in Turkey, for instance, it used to be a parliamentary system and in the last couple of years they had a constitutional uh, uh, amendment which changed the system into a presidential system. The last point in this regard is that uh, how can we tell that the system is a parliamentary or a presidential or a semi-presidential? Usually in constitutions, each uh, country constitution, uh, there is a, a clear statement about the type of the political system. Um, if you uh, um, Google different copies of uh, American constitution, for instance, British, uh, French, um, German, um, in uh, any other country, you will find an article in the constitution that tells that the system is uh, presidential, parliamentary, or semi-presidential. Uh, so it is decided in the uh, constitution. If the constitution that does not say it out loud, uh, usually we can tell by the type of relationship that exists between the legislative and the executive, as we will discuss in the coming slides. So, okay, before we start uh, discussing the details of the presidential system, let's have an overview uh, on the presidential systems around the globe. Uh, in terms of history, presidential systems are newer than parliamentary system, meaning that, historically speaking, um, modern states developed into a parliamentary system, and later on, uh, because of different challenges and problems of the parliamentary system, uh, some countries decided that it's better for them to adapt a different system that is a presidential system. This is one. Second, in, uh, most of the countries that were colonized in the Middle East and Africa, for example, um, most of them, after getting their independence, they adapted a parliamentary system. Uh, later, because they were somehow um, influenced by the colonial powers, mainly Britain, which which is a parliamentary system. Later on, most of these countries uh, decided to uh, shift to a presidential system. And, and, and accordingly, the number of presidential systems around the globe is, has been increasing in the last couple of decades, and the parliamentary systems are decreasing. Um, the other point important in this overview is that uh, presidential systems do not exist except in republics. And this is very important, and we need to pay close attention to this. Presidential systems do not exist except in republics. And a republic is a country where the head of the state is elected. Um, it doesn't matter how he's elected, the term of election, whether he's elected for two terms or more than this. But the point is that the head of the state is elected. So the country is called a republic, not a monarchy. A monarchy, the head of the state gets to his office through hereditary, meaning that um, the next in line to the to the king or queen would be would become the king or queen after uh, the current one um, uh, dies. But in a republic, the head of the state has to uh, uh, get to his office through elections. So a presidential system exists only in republics, and there is uh, no direct connection between uh, the quality of election, the term of uh, the, the president, and, uh, and many, this has nothing to do with uh, the quality of the post that has nothing to do with the type of the post, the, the system, which is a presidential system. Uh, the point in the last point in this overview that in presidential system, the head of the state is the head of the government. The head of the state is the head of the executive branch. It's one person. There is no distinction or differentiation between the head of the state and the head of the government. It's one person taking both offices. So he is serving, he or she is serving as the head of the state and the head of the government. Like the American example, for instance, the American president is the head of the state and the head of the executive branch. Um, <clears throat> 
different cases of the case in Turkey uh, after the last uh, constitutional amendment, the head of the state, uh, Erdogan, is the head of the executive branch. So there is no distinction between the head of the state and the head of the government. So to make things easier for everybody, we're going to discuss the uh, United States of America as an example of the presidential system. And um, the thing that we need to start with is to uh, um, understand the relationship between the legislative and the executive. As we have discussed many times before that both branches are uh, important branches. The legislative branch is about uh, formation of laws, our legislation of laws, and the executive branch is about implementation of laws. Um, and again, we said we said this before that the uh, presidential system is about a certain arrangement of the relationship between the two branches. So in this case, what is the arrangement in the American example? The arrangement is that each branch of them is independent independent from the other, independent in terms of elections, independent of, in terms of jurisprudence or um, uh, area domain of work, independent in terms of what we call a check and balance. Again, <clears throat> what do we mean by independent branches? In terms of election, we in, in the American system, which is a presidential system, we have two types of election. One election to choose members of the legislative body and another separate election to choose the president and his vice and we will discuss this uh, in, in uh, details later but the point is that we have two public elections one to choose different members of the legislative body and the other one to choose the president and his vice president okay in terms of, of domain of action each one of them has a separate domain of action which make um, them independent as much as possible meaning that in terms of legislation for instance um, the members of the legislative body in the US which is called the Congress are the one responsible for uh, proposing and discussing and um, uh, finalizing different legislatives and making them into laws. Members of the executive branch cannot in their uh, uh, capacity, propose laws. What they can do if they if they have an idea that uh, about a new legislation, for instance, or about a new thing they need to legislate about, they can propose the uh, the idea to a member in the Congress or members in the Congress, and those members in the Congress would adapt the idea and present it to the legislative body. Each one of them is working independently from the other. The point about check and balance is that the American Constitution has drafted the relationship between the two in a way that makes each one of them uh, capable of working independently, but at the same time uh, has counter powers, counter uh, abilities to, um, to check the other. So none of them is more powerful than the other. Check and balance mean that the executive and the legislative body in the US, uh, our example, is co-equal that they do not, um, they share the power together and they check and balance each other, but none of them is more important or more powerful than the other. Again, this is very important and, and this is in theory, in practice, of course, there are uh, many differences, and some of them, in certain cases, are more important than the other. Uh, but in theory, and the way the founding fathers of the American system drafted it, uh, they wanted to make both the legislative and the executive as powerful as each other. It's very interesting that um, for this year, uh, we're uh, in the process of preparing for the presidential elections in the U.S. and we would highly recommend that you follow the news on this uh, in this regard. Um, presidential elections in the U.S. happens every four years. The American president is elected uh, twice for uh, two terms maximum 
and um, and and uh, this is a new amendment to the constitution. I think the amendment happened in the 50s. Uh, before that, the American president could be elected for more than two terms. Uh, but I think uh, sometime in the 50s, I'm not sure about the date. Maybe we can share this. Uh, the there was a constitutional amendment, and now the American president cannot be elected for more than two terms, each term four years. The point is that uh, in preparing for the election, um, the process is so long that it takes almost two years uh, to get to the presidential election and to uh, vote for the new president. One year uh, is elections within political parties, and as you already know, in the U.S. we have two political parties, the Republican and the Democrats, and within each uh, party there is uh, what they call preliminary uh, elections, uh, elections taking place within the political party among different candidates. Um, the number is not important. Sometimes there are 10 candidates competing, three candidates competing against each other. But the, what is important for us is that by the end of the first year, one person would get the nomination of the political party, meaning that he, succeed, he or she succeeded throughout this year in convincing members of the political party, um, the Republican or the Democrat, uh, has been successful in convincing them that he or she makes a perfect candidate and he can win the election. Um, after getting the nomination of the political party, there is almost another year of competition between candidates of different political parties and also independent candidates, which theoretically speaking have the right to run for presidency, but in practical sense, um, this has not been the case in the U.S. Usually candidates for presidency are representatives of different political parties, which are the Republican and the Democrats. Over a year, the two candidates would uh, compete against each other. And at the end of the second year of the presidential race, people, uh, through uh, what they have in the American system, uh, um, electoral college, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, complicated process, and we don't need to worry about it now, but we need to know that at the end of the second year, people would go to vote for their president and their vice president, as we have discussed uh, previously in um, um, last lectures, that you vote for the president and the vice president, okay? So you vote for them together, and there, um, uh, once they succeed, once they win the election, the president and the vice president is there till the end of the term, till the end of the four years. There is nothing can uh, remove the president and the vice president from office till the end of the, um, the term, except for a process called the impeachment. But there is no early elections at all in the presidential system. So you vote for the president and his vice, or the president and her vice, and they're there in the, in the Oval House, Oval Office, I'm sorry, uh, till the end of the term after the four years. If, so, if anything happens to the president throughout the four years, the, the vice president would um, uh, take over till the end of the term. Once the president is elected and his vice, uh, then he uh, uh, um, <coughs> starts to formulate his, uh, the rest of the executive branch, meaning the, um, the secretaries, they call it Secretary of State, for different files, for agriculture, for health, for defense, for uh, foreign affairs, uh, for whatever. And he also uh, appoints uh, different members of the executive branch, meaning his uh, office, who's going to help him in the, his office, and uh, different uh, agencies working with the president. Uh, he, he, uh, and uh, when he appoints those people, uh, uh, he doesn't have to um, get them from his own political party. He can ask anyone he thinks, he or she thinks, that is suitable for the post to work with him, meaning he can get people from his own political party, experts from 
uh, outside of the political party, he can even theoretically speaking get people from the other political party, which is the, the almost impossible to do, but theoretically he can do this. Okay, and he gets to nominate uh, and name different people he wants to help. Okay, after that, the president has to get the uh, uh, endorsement of the legislative body on the choice. Okay, and uh, uh, if he gets the endorsement of the legislative body, then he can start uh, his his uh, his uh, his duties. He can um, um, uh, start fulfilling his responsibilities and duties. Let's talk a little bit about the responsibilities of the president uh, as the head of the state and the head of the executive branch. Number one responsibility of the president that he is responsible for the actions of his executive branch, meaning his aides, his secretary of state. Uh, uh, he's responsible for their choice, for choosing those people. He's responsible uh, for making sure that they're doing uh, a good job and following up uh, on their performance. And if they're making any mistakes, he is responsible for this. Uh, the second responsibility of the president in the presidential system is that he is the president, uh, he is the chief commander of the army, meaning he is the highest post of the military. Uh, he doesn't need to be uh, familiar with military actions or training or personnel, but he is the political leader of the army, meaning that in case of war, he is the one who declares war, he is the one who uh, uh, declares sending troops, uh, and the, if you follow the news, uh, it is usually the American president who comes and make a, a statement about sending American troops to uh, Iraq, for instance, or uh, taking troops for, out of Iraq. Uh, the third responsibility, and this is uh, a unique moment in history, uh, and I think most of you have seen this in the news in the last couple of days, the president is responsible for the declaration of state of emergency. Um, because of COVID-19, <coughs> you uh, probably have seen uh, the many press uh, conferences uh, President Trump had in the last couple of days, declaring the state of emergency and um, stating what exactly the state of emergency means and directing uh, resources in uh, different agencies in the country to manage uh, the health crisis uh, uh, we're facing. Uh, the, uh, the other responsibility the president has, and this is very important, and he has the executive power to allocate resources. Meaning, uh, again, referring to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, <coughs> you would probably have heard him saying that he has directed the allocation of, uh, I don't remember the number, the exact number of the dollars, but he allocated uh, resources to deal with the current crisis in terms of health and economics. He, the American president has the power to allocate resources to handle certain challenges, problems, uh, crises, like natural disasters, uh, uh, sending out, uh, peacekeeping troops, uh, uh, or handling <coughs> health crises like the one we're facing now. Usually, uh, after a certain amount of money, he needs the endorsement of the Congress to this action, uh, meaning that uh, uh, the, uh, the Constitution gave the American president the power to manage certain amounts of resources, of money, to uh, direct them uh, through executive orders to uh, uh, cases or areas or issues that he thinks um, uh, are important and they need uh, quick interaction, a quick intervention. But after a certain amount of money, he cannot allocate resources without the approval and the endorsement of the legislative body. The last <coughs> Uh, responsibility of the president, which is also very important, is uh, he has the power to endorse or veto legislations passed by the Congress. As we already know that the Congress, as the legislative body in the U.S., is responsible for making laws. But after the legislative body approve 
uh, a bill, a draft, and they make it a law, they need the approval of the president. And the president has the right either to endorse, meaning to approve the legislative, and this is the final step, and accordingly it would become a law. Or if the president has a problem with the legislation, with, with the piece of legislation he uh, is asked to approve, he can veto the legislative. Veto the legislative, meaning that he has the power to give it back to the legislative body, saying that I don't think this is the right decision to make and we need to review the legislative uh, the, the legislation you just approved in this case if the president veto the legislation it has to go back to the congress and the congress has to uh, discuss it again but if they can secure a two-third majority passing the law, meaning that if two-thirds of the Congress think that the legislative, this piece of legislation is a good one and they approve it, then it would become a law regardless of what the president think. But if they cannot secure the two-thirds, then the veto of the president would make the legislative void, meaning that this bill would never become a law. Now we come to the uh, electing uh, of the legislative and its responsibility. Uh, the American Congress is made of uh, uh, bicameral, meaning two uh, chambers or two houses. One is the House of Representatives, representing the nation, the people, and the other one is the uh, Senate, which represents the states. Um, as we have discussed before, that uh, each country uh, uh, based on many factors, uh, would opt to uh, bicameral or unicameral. And uh, in our case, uh, in the US, uh, the Congress, the legislative body, is made of the two houses. One, uh, for uh, maintaining equality between different states, uh, regardless of the size, the resources, the population, the location. So each state is represented by two representatives in the Senate. Uh, and uh, they have equal votes in the Senate, so um, strong or rich or big states do not have more power than the uh, weaker ones. The other house in the uh, legislative is the House of Representatives, and in this house it's uh, based on um, uh, representing a population or the nation in general. So uh, there is a proportion for uh, uh, um, different people, meaning that uh, small states get less representatives than big states in order to make sure that the population in general are represented in a more equal way. Both houses share the responsibility of legislative in monitoring the performance of the government as well as the impeachment process. Meaning that uh, in the US, uh, remember when we were discussing legislatives in general and uh, we were discussing that in bicameral houses, uh, there is an upper house and lower house, which yeah, meaning that one of them is uh, stronger than the other. In the American experience, both houses are equal and none of them is more important or more powerful than the other one. Uh, they both share the responsibilities of legislation or monitoring the performance of the government or impeachment, meaning the process through which they uh, can uh, uh, remove the president or any member in the executive branch. Okay, so now we come to a very important point in the relationship between the legislative and the executive in the presidential <laughs> and in our example, uh, the uh, uh, American example. Okay, the uh, as we already discussed that each branch is working independent from each other, but there is always a chance of check and balance. So just to make sure that every branch is. Uh, uh, um, has the ability to uh, to to uh, to check what the other branch is doing and to balance its power. But there are two important uh, uh, points in the relationship. One is what if there is a problem 
between the legislative and the executive, and this problem cannot be solved. What we call in political science a gridlock or a deadlock. A deadlock is a situation where there is severe disagreement between the legislative and the executive, and this severe disagreement cannot be solved. In presidential system, in um, this is a very rare case um, because the system, because everybody knows that there is no way out of the deadlock or the gridlock, so everybody is trying to compromise. Both the legislative and the executive would compromise differences, meaning that they would not let things reach a point where there is no solution for a problem between the two branches. They would compromise uh, in order to uh, to uh, make things go and uh, no, do not, not to block uh, the the system as a whole. Because if if there is a case where there is unsolvable problems between the legislative and the executive, the uh, in the presidential system, what we end up with is what we call a shut a shutdown of the government and this has been the case uh, during Obama time and during uh, Trump time where there were uh, problems between the legislative and the executive over <coughs> certain programs and certain uh, allocation of resources and the problems were not uh, solved between the two uh, and it meant that the legislative is not going to endorse resources for the um, executive to implement its program and the executive are insisting on their program what happened is that the government the executive branch shut down literally shut down shut down meaning that they stopped services except for uh, vital services such as police and health like in other than this everything shut down but the deadlock or the gridlock in the presidential system are very rare cases because if they happen the, it means that the system would totally shut down and it's a very 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 serious challenge to the system and the problem of the system but at the end it's a way of making sure that the legislative and the executive are coordinating and checking and balancing each other the other thing in the relationship between the legislative and the executive is the power of the legislative to impeach the members of the executive branch from the president down meaning that the uh, legislative body has the power uh, if they think and agree that the president or members of the executive branch have done great uh, uh, crimes, uh, that the legislative body has the power to remove the president and members of the executive branch. The process of impeachment is a very complicated process and a very difficult process to start. But once it started and it got to the end where the president is impeached, there is a very important consequence for the impeachment process. This important consequence is that the president and members of the executive branch lose their immunity. According to the Constitution, the president and members of the executive branch are immune against uh, trial after they leave office for anything they done, any decision they made during their office, meaning that if the president decided to send troops to Iraq, for instance, and um, uh, once he leaves office, nobody can question his action and uh, put him to trial for sending troops into Iraq. But if the president is impeached, Meaning, uh, or any member of the executive branch, it means that any decision he made during his term can be questioned before the uh, judiciary. And it's a very important consequence. Uh, in political science, we call it he loses the safe exit. Safe exit is that when the president is protected, protected against <coughs> um, a judiciary or investigation for any of his action. Uh, or decisions he made during office. So the presidential system works uh, under a very important uh, principle, which is compromise, meaning that um, the branches have to work together and compromise with each other in order to uh, make the system survive. Um, the check and balance uh, mean means that uh, neither of the branches has the power to uh, dissolve or deconstruct the other 
especially the executive do not have the power to dissolve the parliament or uh, uh, call for early election. Uh, and uh, based on the American experience, it seems as a very functional system and a very successful one. But anyway, there are a number of challenges to the presidential system. The main challenges facing a presidential system are three. One is that people expect too much from the president because the belief, the common belief, is that the president can do almost anything and everything. And he can revive the economy, uh, make America great again, uh, solve the health crisis, do everything. And this is not realistic and nobody can do everything. But there is a problem that people expect too much from the president and because at the end he cannot deliver what they expect all the time there is high level of frustration with the performance of the administration the second point is that in presidential system there is a, a tendency to concentrate power within the executive branch because as we as we have seen in the um, um, functions and responsibilities of the president and his uh, his uh, executive uh, members of his executive uh, there is a concentration in power and this concentration in power if not public media political parties legislative body and other institutions in the uh, state that are working properly this might lead to dictatorship so there is a fear of concentration of power the last challenge to the system is what we call a stagnation in the system. A stagnation in the system, uh, this comes uh, or stems from uh, the fact that uh, everybody is stuck with the legislative and the executive for the term of election, meaning that if the legislative body is elected for four years, we can do nothing about them till the next election we cannot change them if the presidential election is um, is scheduled every six years once we elect the president we are uh, stuck with the choice for the end of the six years there is no ability the system does not have the ability to change uh, um, during the term of election and this is in contrast to the uh, parliamentary system, which we are going to discuss in the next lecture. But the stagnation problem is very important, very serious challenge, because it means that once we elect the president and the legislative body, we're stuck with them till the end of their term. There is no way to change them. And this might uh, give them a sense of confidence that they can do whatever. They cannot uh, be removed, and they can... Uh, they, they don't have to fear the reaction of the public until the next election. So to wrap up what we have discussed this, uh, this lecture, we discussed the history of the presidential system and its development. We've discussed election of the uh, president and his responsibility and election of the legislative and their responsibility. We also discussed the main uh, uh, junctures of the relationship between the uh, two. Uh, the legislative and the executive in terms of impeachment and deadlocks. And finally, we've discussed the challenges to the system. So for next lecture, uh, we're going to discuss the parliamentary system and the differences between the parliamentary system and the presidential system. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me at amalhamada at faps.edu.eg. Uh, if you have any recommendation to make the lecture more interactive, um, have a small chat group on Facebook or any of the applications you're familiar with, please let me know. Meanwhile, uh, stay home and wash your hands and I'll see you shortly, inshallah.